Come have a seat in the skull circle and hear the tale of Prince Unexpected, as told by Kesmir. Before we begin our tale, we'd like to remind you that we release new stories for free weekly on Wednesdays on our website, Apple Podcasts, Google Play Music, Spotify, Podbean, and more. Visit www.thescaldcircle.com for more information. Now then, this begins the tale of Prince Unexpected. Once upon a time, there was a king and queen who had been married for three years, but had no children, at which they were both very distressed. Now the king found himself obliged to make a visit to all of the towns in his kingdom. He took leave of his queen, set off, and was not home for eight months. Towards the end of the ninth month, the king returned from his progress through his country, and was already nearby his capital city when, as he journeyed over an uninhabited plain during the most scorching heat of summer, he felt such excessive thirst that he sent his servants round about to see if they could find water anywhere and let him know of it at once. The servants dispersed in various directions, sought in vain for a whole hour, and returned without success to the king. The thirst-tormented king proceeded to traverse the whole plain far and wide himself, not believing that there was not a spring somewhere or other. On he rode and on a level spot, on which there had not previously been any water, he espied a well with a new wooden fence round it, full to the brim with spring water, and in the midst of which floated a silver cup with a golden handle. The king sprang from his horse and reached after the cup with his right hand, but the cup, just as if it were alive and had eyes, darted quickly on one side and floated again by itself. The king knelt down and began to try to catch it, now with his right hand, now with his left. But it moved and dodged away in such a manner, not being able to seize it with one hand, he tried to catch it with both. But scarcely had he reached out with both hands, when the cup dived like a fish and floated again on the surface. Fire upon it, thought the king. I can't help myself with a cup, I'll manage without it. He then bent down to the water, which was clear as crystal and cold as ice, and began in his thirst to drink. Meanwhile, his long beard, which reached down to his girdle, dipped into the water. When he had quenched his thirst, he wanted to get up again. Something was holding his beard and would not let it go. He pulled once and again, but it was of no use. He cried out, therefore, in anger, Who's there? Let's go! It's I, the king of the underworld, immortal Bonnie. And I shall not let it go till you give me that which you left unknowingly at home, and which you do not expect to find on your return. The king looked into the depth of the well, and there was a huge head like a toad, with green eyes and a mouth from ear to ear which was holding the king by the beard with its extended claws like those of a crab, and laughing mischievously. The king thought that a thing of which he had not known before starting and which he did not expect in return could not be of great value. So he said to the apparition, I give it. The apparition burst with laughter and vanished with a flash of fire. And with it vanished also the well, the water, the wooden fets, and the cup. The king was again on a hillock by a small forest kneeling on dry sand, and there was nothing more. The king got up, crossed himself, sprang on his horse, and hastened to his attendants, and they rode on. In a week or maybe a fortnight, the king arrived at his capital. The people came out in crowds to meet him. He went in procession to the great court of the palace and entered the corridor. In the corridor stood the queen awaiting him, holding close to her bosom a cushion, on which lay a child, beautiful as the moon, kicking in swaddling clothes. The king recollected himself, sighed painfully, and said within himself, This is what I left without knowing and found without expecting. And bitterly, bitterly did he weep. All marveled, but none dared ask the cause. The king took his son without saying a word in his arms, gazed long on his innocent face, 
carried him to the palace himself, laid him in a cradle, and suppressing his sorrow, devoted himself to ruling his kingdom, but was never again cheerful as was, since he was perpetually tormented by the thought that some day Boni would claim his son. Meanwhile, weeks, months, and years flowed on, and no one came for his son. The prince named Unexpected grew and eventually became a handsome youth. The king also in course of time regained his usual cheerfulness and forgot what had taken place, but alas, not everyone did forget so easily. Once the prince while hunting in a forest became separated from his suite and found himself in a savage wilderness. Suddenly there appeared before him a hideous old man with green eyes who said, How do you do, Prince Unexpected? You have made me wait for you a long time. Who are you? That you will find out hereafter. But now, when you return to your father, greet him from and tell him that I should be glad if he would close accounts with me. For if he doesn't soon get out of my debt himself, he will repent it bitterly. After saying this, the hideous old man disappeared, and the prince in amazement turned his horse, rode home and told the king his adventure. The king turned as pale as a sheet and revealed the frightful secret to his son. Don't cry, father, replied the prince. All hope is not lost. I shall force Boney to renounce... I shall force Boney to renounce the right over me, which he tricked out of you in such an underhanded manner. If in the course of a year I do not return, it can be assumed I shall never return. The prince prepared for his journey. The king gave him a suit of steel armor, a sword, and a horse, and the queen hung round his neck a cross of pure gold. At his departure they embraced affectionately, wept heartily, and the prince rode off. On he rode, one day, two days, three days, and at the end of the fourth day, At the setting of the sun, he came to the shore of the sea, and in the bay spied twelve dresses, white as snow. Though in the water, as far as the eye could reach, there was no living soul to be seen, only twelve white geese which were swimming at a distance from the shore. Curious to know whom they belonged, he took one of the dresses, let his horse loose in a meadow, concealed himself in a neighboring thicket, and waited to see what would come to pass. Thereupon the geese, after enjoying themselves in the sea, swam to the shore. Eleven of them went to their dresses, each threw herself on the ground and became a beautiful damsel, dressing herself with speed and flew away onto the plain. The twelfth goose, the last and prettiest of all, did not venture to come out on the shore, only wistfully stretching out her neck, looking on all sides. On seeing the prince, she called out in a human voice, Prince Unexpected! Give me my dress, I will be grateful to you in return. The prince hearkened to her, placed the dress on the grass, and modestly turned away in another direction. The goose came out of the grass, changed herself into a damsel, and dressed herself hastily, and stood before the prince. She was young and more beautiful than I had ever seen or ear heard of. Blushing, she gave him her white hand, and casting her eyes down, said with a pleasing voice, I thank you, good prince, for hearkening to me. I am the youngest daughter of a mortal bony. He has twelve young daughters and rules in the underworld. My father, prince, has long been expecting you and is very angry. However, don't grieve and don't be frightened, but do as I tell you. As soon as you see King Bony, fall upon your knees at once, and paying no regard to his outcry, unbraiding and threats, approach him boldly. What will happen afterwards you will learn. But now we must part. On saying this, the princess stamped on the ground with her little foot. The ground sprang open at once, and they descended into the subterranean realm, right into Boney's palace, which shone underground brighter than the sun. The prince stepped boldly into the reception room. Boney was sitting on a golden throne with a glittering crown on his head. His eyes gleamed like two saucers of green glass, and his hands were like the claws of a crab. As soon as he espied him at the distance, the prince fell on his knees, and Boney yelled so horribly that the vaults of the subterranean dominion quaked, and the prince boldly moved forward on his knees towards the throne. 
and when he was only a few paces from it, the king smiled and said, Thou hast marvelous luck in succeeding to make me smile. Remain in our subterranean realm, but before thou becomest a true citizen thereof, thou art bound to execute three commands of mine. But because it is late, today we will begin tomorrow. Meanwhile, go to thy room. The prince slept comfortably in the room assigned to him, and early on the morrow Boney summoned him and said, We will see, prince, what thou canst do. In the course of the following night, build me a palace of pure marble. Let the windows be of crystal, the roof of gold, an elegant garden round it, and the garden seats and fountains. If thou buildest it, thou wilt gain thyself my love. If not, I shall command thy head to be cut off. The prince heard it, returned to his room, and was sitting mournfully thinking of the death that threatened him. When outside at the window, a bee came bussing and said, Let me in! He opened the lattice and in flew the bee, and the princess, Boney's youngest daughter, appeared before the wandering prince. What are you thus thinking about, Prince Unexpected? Alas, I am thinking that your father wishes to deprive me of my life. Don't be afraid. Lie down to sleep, and when you get up tomorrow morning, your palace will be ready. So too it came to pass. At dawn the prince came out of his room and espied a beautiful palace, more beautiful than he'd ever seen. And Boney, when he saw it, wandered and wouldn't believe his own eyes. Well, thou hast won this time, and thou hast a second command, I shall place my twelve daughters before thee tomorrow. If thou dost not guess which of them is the youngest, thou wilt place thy head beneath the axe. I, unable to recognize the youngest princess, said prince in his room, what difficulty can there be in that? This, answered the princess, flying into the room in the shape of the bee, that if I don't help you, you won't recognize me, for we are all so alike that even our father distinguishes us by our dress. What am I to do? What indeed? That will be the youngest over there. What indeed? That will be the youngest over whose right eye you espy a ladybug. Only look carefully. Anon, on the morrow King Boney again summoned Prince Unexpected. The princesses stood in a row side by side, all dressed alike with eyes cast down. The prince looked and marveled how alike all the princesses were. He went past them once, twice, and he did not find the appointed token. The third time, he saw a ladybug over the eyebrow of one and cried out, That is the youngest princess. How the deuce have you guessed it? As said Boney angrily. There must be some trickery here. I must deal with your lordship differently. In three hours you will come here again, and will show your cleverness in my presence. I shall light a straw and you will stitch a pair of boots before it goes out, and if you don't do it, you will perish. The prince returned, desponding, and found the bee already in his apartment. Why pensive again, prince? How shouldn't I be pensive when your father wants me to stitch him a pair of boots? What sort of cobbler am I? What else will you do? What am I to do? I shan't stitch the boots, and I'm not afraid of death. One can but die once. No, prince, you shall not die. I will endeavor to rescue you, and we will either escape together or perish together. We must flee. There is nothing else to be done. Saying this, the princess spat on one of the window panes, and the spittle immediately froze. She then went out of the room with the prince, locked the door after her, and threw the key far away. Then, taking each other by the hands, they ascended rapidly and in a moment found themselves in the very spot whence they had descended into the underworld. There was the selfsame sea, the selfsame shore overgrown with rushes and thorn bushes, the selfsame fresh meadow, and in the meadow cantered the prince's well-fed horse, who as soon as he saw his rider came galloping straight to him. The prince didn't stop long to think, but sprang on his horse, the princess seated herself behind him, and off they set as swift as an arrow. King Boney at the appointed hour did not wait for Prince Unexpected, but sent to ask him why he did not appear. Finding the door locked, the servants knocked at it vigorously, and the spittle answered them from the middle of the room in the prince's voice. Anon! 
The servants carried this answer to the king. He waited, waited, no prince. Therefore again sent the same servants, who heard the same answer, Anon, and carried what they heard to the king. What's this does he mean to make fun of me? shouted the king in wrath. Go at once, break the door open and conduct him to me. The servants hurried off, broke open the door and rushed in. What indeed? There was no one there, and the spittle on the pane of the glass was shaking with laughter at them. Boney all but burst with rage, and ordered them all to start off in pursuit of the prince, threatening them with death if they were turned empty-handed. They sprang on horseback and hastened away after the prince and princess. Meanwhile, Prince Unexpected and the princess, Boney's daughter, were hurrying away on their spirited horse. Amidst their rapid flight, heard the sound of hoofbeats behind them. Prince sprang from the horse, put his ears to the ground, and said, They are pursuing us. Then, said the princess, we have no time to lose. Instantly, she transformed herself into a river, and changed the prince into a bridge, the horse into a raven, and the grand highway beyond the bridge divided into three roads. Swiftly on the fresh track hastened the pursuers, came to the bridge and stood stupefied. They saw the track up to the bridge, but beyond it it disappeared, and the highway divided into three roads. There was nothing to be done but to return. They came with naught. Boney shouted with rage and cried out, A bridge and a river! It was they! How is it that ye did not guess it? Back and don't return without them! The pursuers continued the pursuit. I hear hoofbeats, whispered the princess, affrightedly the prince unexpected, who sprang from the saddle put his ear to the ground and replied, They are making haste, and they are not far off. That instant the princess and prince, and with them their horse, became a gloomy forest, in which there were roads, by-roads, and footpaths without number. And on one of them it seemed that two riders were hastening on a horse. Following the fresh track, the pursuers came up to the forest, and when they espied the fugitives in it, they hastened speedily after them. On and on the hurried pursuers, seeing continually before them a thick forest, a wide road, and the fugitives on it. Now, now, they fought to overtake them, when the fugitives and the thick forest suddenly vanished, and they found themselves at the same place whence they had started in pursuit. They returned, therefore, again to Boney, empty-handed. A horse, a horse, I will go myself, they won't escape out of my hands, yelled Boney, foaming at the mouth, and started in pursuit. Again the princess said to Prince Unexpected, Methinks they are pursuing us. This time it is my father himself. But the first church is the boundary of his dominion, and he won't be able to pursue us. Give me your golden cross. The prince took off his affectionate mother's gift and gave it to the princess. And in a moment she was transformed into a church, he into a priest, and the horse into a bell. And that instant up came Boney. Monk, Boney asked the priest. Hast thou not seen some travellers on horseback? Only just now Prince Unexpected rode this way with the princess. They came into the church, performed their devotions, gave money for a mass for your good health, and ordered me to present their respects to you if you should ride this way. Boney, too, returned empty-handed, but Prince Unexpected rode on with the princess. Boney's daughter. But Prince Unexpected rode on with the princess in no further fear of pursuit. They rode gently on, when they saw before them a beautiful town, into which the prince felt an irresistible longing to go. Prince, said the princess, don't go. My heart forebodes misfortune there. I'll only ride there for a short time and look round the town. We'll then proceed in our journey. It's easy enough to ride thither, but will it be easy to return? Nevertheless, as you absolutely desire it, go, and I will remain here in the form of a white stone till you return. Be circumspect, my beloved. The king, queen, and the princess, their daughter, will come out to meet you, and with them will be a beautiful little boy. Don't kiss him, for if you do, you will forget me at once, and will never set eyes on me more in the world. I shall die of despair. I will wait for you here on the road for three days, and if on the third day you don't return, remember that I perish, and I perish through your own doing. The prince took leave and rode to the town and the princess transformed herself into a white stone and remained on the road. One day passed, 
a second day passed, and the third day also passed, and nothing was seen of the prince. Poor princess, he had not listened to her. In the town, the king, the queen, and the princess, their daughter, had come out to meet him, and with them walked a little boy, a curly-headed chatterbox with eyes as bright as stars. The child rushed straight into the prince's arms, who was so captivated by the beauty of the boy that he forgot everything and kissed the child affectionately on the cheek. That moment his memory was darkened, and he utterly forgot the princess. The princess lay as a white stone by the wayside. One day, two days, and when the third day passed, the prince did not return from the town. She transformed herself into a cornflower, and sprang in among the rye on the roadside. Here I shall stay by the roadside. Maybe some passerby will pull me up or trample me into the ground, said she, and tears like dewdrops glittered on the azure petals. Just then an old man came along the road, and espied the cornflower in the rye by the wayside, and was captivated by its beauty. Extracted it carefully from the ground, carried it into his dwelling, set it in a flower pot, watered it, and began to tend it attentively. But, oh marvel! Ever since the time the cornflower was brought into his dwelling, all kinds of wonders began to happen in it. Scarcely was the old man awake when everything in the house was already set in order. Nowhere was the least atom of a speck remaining. At noon he came home, dinner was all ready, the table set, he had but to sit down and eat as much as he wanted. The old man wondered and wondered, till at last terror took possession of him. And he betook himself for advice to an old witch of his acquaintance in the neighborhood. Do this, the witch advised him. Get up before the first morning dawn, before the cocks crow to announce daylight, and notice diligently what begins to stir first in the house. That which does stir first, cover with this napkin. What will happen further you will see. The old man didn't close his eyes the whole night, and as soon as the first gleam appeared and things began to be visible in the house, he saw how the cornflower suddenly moved in the flower pot, sprang out and began to stir about the room when simultaneously everything began to put itself in place. The dust began to sweep itself clean. The fire kindled itself in the stove. The old man sprang cleverly out of his bed and placed the cloth on the flower as it endeavored to escape. When lo, the flower became a beautiful damsel, the princess, daughter of Bonnie. What have you done? cried the princess. Why have you brought life back to me again? My betrothed prince unexpected has forgotten me and therefore life has become distasteful to me. Your betrothed prince unexpected is to be married today. The wedding feast is ready and the guests are beginning to assemble. The princess wept, but after a while she dried her tears, dressed herself in wool, and went into the town like a village girl. She came to the royal kitchen, where there was a great noise and bustle. She went up to the clerk of the kitchen with humble and attractive grace, and said in a sweet voice, Dear sir, do me one favor. Allow me to make a wedding cake for the prince, unexpected. Occupied with work, the first impulse of the clerk was to give the girl a rebuff. But when he looked at her, the words died in his lips, and he answered kindly, Ah, my beauty of beauties, do what you will. I will hand the prince your cake myself. The cake was soon baked, and all the invited guests were sitting at the table. The clerk of the kitchen himself placed a huge cake on a silver dish before the prince. But scarce had the prince made a cut into the side of it when, lo, an unheard of marvel displayed itself in presence of all. A gray tom pigeon and a white hen pigeon came out of the cake. The tom pigeon walked along the table and the hen pigeon walked after him, cooing. Stay, stay, my pigeonette, oh stay, don't from thy true love flee away. My faithless lover I pursue, prince unexpected like unto, whose bony's daughter did betray. Stay, stay, my pigeonette, oh stay, don't from thy true love flee away. My faithless lover I pursue, prince unexpected like unto, who bony's daughter did betray. Scarcely had prince unexpected heard the cooing of this pigeon when he regained all his lost memory, bounced from the table and rushed to the door. And behind the door the princess daughter of Bonnie took him by the hand. They went together down the corridor, and before them stood a horse, saddled and bridled. Why delay, they thought. Prince unexpected and the princess sprang on the horse and started in the road. And at last they arrived happily in the realm of Prince Unexpected's father. 
The king and queen received them with joy and merriment, and didn't wait long before they prepared them a magnificent wedding, the like of which eye never saw and ear never heard of. And they lived happily ever after. And that is the tale of Prince Unexpected. Thank you for listening to our story. If you enjoyed it, please take a look at our Patreon page to learn how you can earn great rewards while also supporting us. A special thank you to Cat for their support this month. It means the world to us. Remember, we release new tales for free weekly on Wednesdays. Find out where you can hear them on our website at www.thescaldcircle.com. Once again, thank you for listening to our story.